morning, we are very happy to have Dr. Fadig Gerges, who is a neurosurgeon uh, at UC Davis, and his subspecialties are in epilepsy, deep brain stimulation, and peripheral nerve surgery, as well as brain tumor surgery. He's trained at a number of different universities, including both in Canada and the U.S., and they include University of Toronto, University of Calgary, Harvard University, Case Western Reserve, and UC Davis. His research focuses on the neurophysiology of cognition and decision-making in humans with numerous active collaborations in basic science and the clinical arenas. This morning, he is going to talk to us about traumatic uh, brachial plexus and peripheral nerve injuries. Dr. Gerkes, welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I just learned this morning that there are some plastic surgeons in the audience, so um, I know you guys do this as well. So please let me know as I go if you're doing anything differently. This is kind of the, the neurosurgery way of, of managing peripheral nerve injuries and brachial plexus uh, trauma. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt with comments, questions as we go. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, outline of the talk today, uh, we're going to be talking about mechanisms of nerve injury, uh, a little bit about pathology and grading, uh, how do we evaluate with somebody with uh, peripheral nerve injury or brachial plexus injury, uh, how do we manage these patients, what is the prognosis. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about types of surgical repair, and then we'll finish off uh, in general with uh, brachial plexus injury, the different types, and, and some surgical procedures for treatment of that. Uh, general mechanisms, these are pretty straightforward. So transection, if a nerve is cut. Uh, stretch injuries, which are quite common actually, especially with brachial plexus injury. Uh, contusion or concussion with gunshot wounds. So uh, as you know, bullets don't often directly go right through the nerve, but rather they tend to cause contusion or damage to the nerve uh, just from the shock injury. Uh, ischemia. Uh, compression, which we won't talk about today, uh, electrical thermal injury, and injection injuries are uh, usually if people are in receiving some kind of injection into the muscle and they accidentally hit a nerve. Uh, just a minute, it's important to uh, review the pathology. Um, so what, hap what actually happens uh, when a nerve is, is injured? There's uh, different mechanisms that happen both on the proximal end as well as on the distal end. So distally, the axons will tend to degenerate. Uh, Schwann cell, uh, Schwann cell sorry, will phagocytose the myelin and axonal debris. Um, and that process is called Wallerian degeneration, and that starts usually about 12 hours or so after the injury. Uh, on the proximal end, uh, ax axonal sprouts begin very early on, usually a few hours after the injury. Um, and if there's some kind of a scaffolding uh, for them to grow along, then they will actually grow and the nerve will recover to some degree. Uh, if there's an external scaffolding, like a basement membrane or the outer uh, membrane of the nerve, uh, they won't really have anywhere to grow, but they'll stay within the nerve and they'll tend to form a neuroma and continuity, kind of like a bulge along the nerve. Um, if the nerve is completely transected and there's nowhere for them to grow, then they'll just end up forming a ball, uh, which is just called a neuroma, okay, or a stump. Of course, nerves, uh, motor nerves for the most part, innervate muscles. So um, when the nerve is cut or damaged, the muscle will denervate and eventually will atrophy. Uh, two years is a general cutoff um, for a time that uh, if the muscle um, has not had any innervation, it will lose its ability to, to receive new input and actually uh, transform into scar and fat, uh, as you can see here. So. Um, if somebody has a nerve injury that's been usually over a year and a half to two years out, uh, there's usually no point in attempting to repair that nerve or, or graft that nerve or transfer that nerve uh, because the muscle itself, the end muscle, will no longer be functional. Uh, grading nerve injury, there's uh, two people and these grading systems we still use. The older one is Seddon uh, and a little bit newer is Sunderland. Uh, I forget which one. One of them was an orthopedic surgeon, the other was a scientist. I forget which one. Both have now passed away. Uh, we'll be talking about both of them because they're both commonly used. Um, and just before we go into that, just a very quick review of nerve anatomy. Um, a nerve is kind of like a, a cable, like a telephone wire, uh, which has many small wi smaller wires inside. Uh, the epineurium is the outer covering of the nerve, and within it are a whole bunch of fascicles. Um, and the fascicles will then contain the, contain the axons. So the fascicles are surrounded by the perineurium. Uh, the axons are within it. There's endoneurium connective tissue around them. And then there's myelin around each axon, uh, which is the fatty substance that allows axons or nerves to conduct at a faster speed. The Sunderland classification uh, classifies based on grades 1 to 5 um, and just goes based on how much of the nerve is actually damaged. Uh, so in grade 1, it's usually just a myelin injury causing a conduction block. These are pretty mild injuries. In grade 2, we add axonal damage. In grade 3, we da add damage to the endoneurium. In grade 4, we add damage to the perineurium, which surrounds the individual fascicles. And grade 5, damage to the epineurium. So grade 5 is actually a transection of the nerve. And I'll talk a little bit more about these. Uh, grade 1 is also in the older classification called neuropraxia. Uh, that's simply a conduction block. Uh, 
Um, the nerve is in continuity. There's no Wallerian degeneration because the axons have not been damaged. Uh, and this usually will recover over a few weeks. And these are pretty mild nerve injuries. Uh, grade 2, or the older classification, calls these exonotemesis. Uh, because there's axonal damage, Wallerian degeneration does occur. Uh, these are relatively mild injuries as well. And there is good regeneration because the endoneurium is intact. Uh, nerves grow about one millimeter per day, and we'll be seeing that number again over the course of the presentation. Uh, there is a Tinel sign, so when you tap on the, the portion of the nerve that's been damaged or compressed, uh, you can feel some electricity kind of radiating from that area. Um, and a lot of these are actually made retrospectively, these kinds of diagnoses, because you have to give the nerve a little bit of time to recover, and when you see how much it recovers, you can then decide on what grade of a nerve injury it was. Grade 3 has scarring in the endoneurium. That means axons must regenerate through scar tissue. Uh, therefore, there's a variable amount of recovery with these. It depends on the nerve. If it's a pure nerve, a motor or sensory nerve, they tend to do better than mixed nerves uh, because there can be some mis mis sorry, mismatching. Um, grade 4 injuries are very severe injuries. Um, the general rule is that if a nerve does not show any evidence of recovery by three months, uh, it is a grade 4 injury. Um, these are basically meaning that the outer, uh, outer covering of the nerve is intact, but all the fascicles inside have been destroyed. Um, so this is pretty much a complete injury, even though the nerve is in continuity, so this would require surgical repair. Um, and the final one is, the, in the previous classification, called a neurotmesis, which is basically a transection of the nerve. Uh, for clinical evaluation, uh, so some general points, important to determine whether or not it's a peripheral or central nervous system problem. Uh, so is this actually a peripheral nerve injury or more of a spinal cord injury or a brain injury? Um, is it focal or diffuse? Is this associated specifically with the trauma? Or does the person have an underlying uh, peripheral nerve disorder, so like, like diabetes, for example, very common? Uh, what grade is the injury? Is it a complete or incomplete injury? Uh, we did mention that severity becomes apparent with time, but sometimes based on the initial injury and the initial severity of the trauma, you can infer the severity of the nerve injury. Um, if it's, for example, a very high-speed uh, motorcycle accident where the person was thrown off and hit a shoulder on a tree and the shoulder you know, pulled away from the neck, um, then that's going to be probably a pretty severe brachial plexus injury, whereas if it's somebody who had a ground level fall or whatnot, it's probably not as severe. So uh, we can often get a sense of the severity of the peripheral nerve injury just based on the severity of the initial trauma. Uh, has there been any evidence of recovery or any deterioration? And is it an open or closed injury? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, on clinical exam, the uh, first thing you want to do is inspect and look for atrophy of particular muscle groups. Uh, Sensory-wise, uh, good to look in autonomous or pure zones, so uh, try to avoid zones that mix uh, with different peripheral nerves. Uh, Again, we talk about upper and lower motor neurons. So um, with upper motor neuron lesions, so lesions in the spinal cord or in the brain or central nervous system, uh, you tend to see hyperreflexia and increased tone. Uh, peripheral nerve injuries, so the opposite of that. You see atrophy, you see hyporeflexia, hypotonia. Uh, grading the individual muscles that are involved. So important to not only grade the myotomes like we normally do for spinal cord injury, but also to grade uh, the individual muscles for each peripheral nerve. Uh, Tenel sign we talked about, which is percussing uh, distal to an injury site. It does provide some evidence favoring nerve regeneration if you do uh, see a, a Tenel sign that's progressing. Uh, so in other words, those electrical sensations are moving uh, farther down the limb over time. That means that there is some recovery. The axons are actually growing. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be functional recovery. The axons may never actually reach the end muscle, or maybe some of them will reach there, but there won't be enough for a functional recovery. Uh, nerve conduction studies, of course, and EMG, which we'll talk about, are uh, critical to the evaluation of these patients. Uh, nerve conduction studies, in general, uh, you know, just test two things. They test sensory nerves and they test motor nerves. Uh, for motor nerves, we stimulate the motor nerve and we record from the muscle, which is called a, a, a CMAP, or a muscle action potential. Uh, and the sensory ones, we stimulate on the sensory nerve distally and record more proximally, uh, which is called a SNAP, or a sensory nerve action potential. So um, in, in essence, you're looking at two different things. You're looking at uh, the latency or the speed of conduction, uh, which can give you a sense of is, the, is there demyelination or damage to the myelin, uh, and also at the amplitude, which gives you a sense how many axons are actually conducting, what is the power of that, of that signal. Okay. Uh, so in neuropraxia, which is a grade one injury, we talked about how there's just a segmental block, uh, and there's preserved distal conduction. Uh, you won't see any changes on EMG in these patients. Uh, if there is axonal damage, you will see some kind of decrease in amplitude and eventually will lose distal conduction. Uh, when muscle is re you can see particular signs for that as well. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, when we get to brachial plexus, specifically about the sensory nerve action potentials uh, and how those can differentiate between uh, injuries that are uh, proximal to the ganglion and, and the brachial plexus or distal. EMG or electromyography, we just put a, a muscle, or sorry, a needle into the muscle and, and basically record the muscle activity. Um, these can identify extent of injury and send a baseline for follow-up. 
Uh, these are not useful until about three weeks after the injury as there's too much noise. So we usually don't do the first uh, nerve conduction study or EMG till at least three weeks after the injury. Um, EMGs will remain normal in neuropraxia because the axon is preserved, there's no denervation. And then there are particular signs that we can look for uh, that show uh, signs of uh, damage uh, to the muscle as well as re-innervation of the muscle as the muscle starts to recover. Uh, but I won't go through those in detail. Uh, imaging in brachial plexus injury. Uh, stir images can sometimes be done and you can see some signal changes in the brachial plexus. Uh, sometimes you can also see muscle denervation. Uh, but for the most part in brachial plexus injury and peripheral nerve injury, mus or imaging in general is not super useful in terms of looking specifically at the nerves. Uh, but it can certainly be useful for other things. Uh, so for example, in brachial plexus injury, if we look at the chest x-ray, we can see sometimes elevation of the hemidiaphragm. Uh, which means the injury of the phrenic nerve, that means it's probably a preganglionic injury, which is something that's more proximal to the spinal cord, which is where that particular nerve comes off. So uh, just based on that, we can get a sense of where in the plexus the injury is. Uh, looking at transverse process fractures on a CT scan can also indicate more proximal injury. Uh, and here we actually see a little pseudomeningocele on a myelogram um, where a nerve root is coming out. So this probably indicates that there was an avulsion to that particular nerve root that has literally been pulled out of the spinal cord and it leaves a little track of CSF there as well. Um, so while we don't usually image nerves directly per se, uh, there are certain lots of other images that can help us determine, you know, the severity of the location or the location of a nerve injury. Uh, moving on to general management, we'll break it up into open injuries and closed injuries. Open injuries, so if somebody has a laceration in their arm and the nerve has been injured, however, it's still in continuity. Um, so it hasn't actually been disrupted, then that would just be medical management. It'll probably be a minor nerve injury. Uh, if the laceration, like a stab wound, for example, has directly transected or cut the nerve, um, simply you sew it back together if you can, um, end to end repair. Um, if it's more of a blunt transection, like a cut from a saw or something that's not as obvious, uh, it can sometimes be better to wait a few weeks, uh, delay the repair. That way the edges of the nerve tend to demarcate a little bit better. At that point, you can resect back the scar and then and sew in a graft. Uh, closed injuries, which are more, much more common than open injuries for nerves, uh, it depends uh, on the type of nerve injury. So if it's a mild nerve injury, we talked about uh, how just medical management and the observation, and those will eventually recover. If it's something more severe, like a grade 4 or grade 5 injury, uh, surgical exploration is often warranted. And when we explore the nerve surgically, you basically expose the nerve, and you can do those uh, nerve conduction studies that we talked about before, but you can do them intraoperatively directly along the course of the nerve. If you see an aroma and continuity, for example, you can stimulate proximal and distal to it and see if there's any nerve conduction through that neuroma. Uh, if there's no conduction, then it's probably not going to work. You need to cut it out and graft it. Um, if there is conduction, there's already been some growth through that scar and the person will probably recover to some degree. When nerves have been avulsed, and sometimes in other cases, uh, we can do neurotizations or nerve transfer procedures and we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Uh, when do we operate? Uh, these are kind of a general rule of thumb, the three plus one, it's easy to remember. Uh, so for transections, like we mentioned, if somebody just gets a nerve that's cut by a stab wound, for example, it's best to do that right away within a few days. Uh, if it's a blunt or jagged transection, usually wait about three weeks. allows the nerve to demarcate, to resect the scar, and be prepared to graft. Three to six months is usually the time frame we use for closed wounds, so whether they be stretch, gunshot wounds, or compression. Uh, so we usually do EMG nerve conduction studies at about three to six weeks, uh, and then again at 12 weeks, and we're looking for changes. Uh, important to examine the patient at 12 weeks to see if anything has recovered, meaning it would be a more minor nerve injury. Uh, and we prepare to explore usually around six months. At one year, um, that's usually the cutoff, a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, to refer the person for tendon transfer surgery rather than nerve repair surgery. Uh, we talked about how muscles usually denervate or become, you know, unusable after about two years. Uh, and we talked about how nerves usually grow at about a millimeter per day. Uh, so you can imagine if you had an injury up, you know, maybe in your ulnar nerve up above your elbow, uh, and you wanted to perform some kind of procedure to repair the nerve here, uh, those axons would have to grow from here uh, down to the intrinsic muscles of the hand for it to be a functional recovery. Uh, so that's about a foot or so. So that would be about a year just for the axons to grow, uh, let alone to re the muscle, redevelop strength, and so forth. So if the person is one year out from injury and you want to do an operation here, uh, let's say it's successful and it takes another year for it to grow down to here, that's been about two years uh, that that muscle has not had any innervation. So it probably... Not probably, but there's a less chance that it will work. So, so usually one year or about 1.5 years is the, uh, the cutoff to uh, abandon any options for uh, nerve repair, nerve transfers, and move directly to tendon transfer operations or muscle transfer operations. There are some exceptions. Uh, if somebody with a transection presents more than three days after the transection, just operate on them right away. There's no point in waiting. Um, and also, it's important to do uh, early surgery for closed lesions if you suspect a large hematoma.
Uh, so if there's a plexus injury but you see a large hematoma, you can see it clinically or maybe on imaging, uh, you might want to take that out because perhaps that's the reason for the problem. It's compressing the nerve. Uh, perioperative care. Uh, secure a thorough clinical and possible electrophysiologic diagnosis. We talked about that. Um, this second point is actually extremely important. So provide active or passive motion of the limb on a frequent and repetitive basis. So um, it's not uncommon that I see patients in clinic who have had a uh, nerve injury, like a brachial plexus injury, uh, about three or four months prior. Uh, and, you know, let's say they have no flexion of their arm, so their arm has been in a sling for the past three months, and they've just never moved it around. Um, so that's certainly a problem because the arm will stiffen, they get contractures and so forth, and their recovery becomes uh, much more difficult. So uh, it's very important that uh, while they're waiting for surgery or after surgery, but not to keep the limb and the joints in motion, uh, otherwise they'll stiffen up. Uh, the pointing out the limitations of peripheral nerve recovery and surgery, and we'll talk a little bit about prog prognosis. Um, make a patient aware that recovery is a very long process. We talked about nerves growing about a millimeter a day or about an inch a month. Uh, so sometimes it can take a year or so before the nerve actually reaches the muscle, which means after that, physical therapy, strengthening the muscle again and so forth. It can be a very, very long process. Uh, important to treat depression or anxiety, as is quite common in these patients. Um, and the last one is also very important. Patients must assume responsibility for their own rehabilitation. Uh, patients who are not that interested, who don't show up to their appointments, who are not doing their physical therapy, uh, they won't have any recovery. Some general rules for prognosticating these uh, injuries. Uh, age, younger is better. Uh, intraoperative nerve action potentials are present. So if the nerve is conducting intraoperatively, then it's going to do better. Uh, the timing of the repair, earlier being better. The level of the injury, more distal is better, simply because axons have a shorter distance to grow. The type of the nerve, pure nerves, so motor or sensory nerves that are pure are better than mixed because there's less chance for mismatching. Uh, motor nerves tend to do better than sensory nerves. The specific nerves themselves, so in the upper limb, uh, radial does better than median, which does better than ulnar. The upper trunk of the brachial plexus does better than the lower trunk, again, shorter distance to grow. And the lower extremity tibial nerve responds better than peroneal nerve. Mechanism of injury, uh, knife wounds or stab wounds tend to do better than gunshot wounds, as you'd expect. And type of repairs, end-to-end -end grafts tend to, to work better than, uh, sorry, end-to-end -end repair tends to work better than sewing in a graft. Uh, we'll talk uh, specifically about the different types of surgical repair, and I'll show some examples here. So we'll talk about external and internal neurolysis, end-to-end -end repairs and grafting, neurotizations or nerve transfer. I'll just have one brief slide on tendon and muscle transfer uh, and resection of painful neuromas. Uh, external neurolysis simply means freeing the nerve circum circumferentially from its surrounding tissue. Um, we pretty much always do this uh, as the first part of any uh, nerve operation. Um, here's an example. This is the uh, left arm. Uh, the ulnar nerve has been dissected out. Uh, you can see one of the branches coming off here to the, F to the flexor carpi ulnaris. Um, so this is an external neurolysis. This nerve has actually been transposed uh, anterior to the medial epicondyle. Um, sometimes simply doing that can be the operation in and of itself, and that can help with, uh, with pain. Uh, internal neurolysis uh, means uh, separating the individual fascicles out for a nerve. So uh, in nerve transfer procedures where we're transferring uh, specific fascicles to others, uh, this is an important part of the procedure to actually separate out the different fascicles of the nerve, uh, stimulate them, see what they're doing. Sometimes you cut them and transfer them and so forth. Okay. You can also do uh, split repairs where if there are some uh, non-functioning fascicles, you can graft specific fascicles rather than the entire nerve. Uh, end to end repairs, uh, very important to cut uh, back until there's a healthy fascicular pattern. So um, if the nerve has been injured, for example, if it was injured intraoperatively with another operation, if it was injured with cautery, it would be important to cut the nerve back to remove the part that's been cauterized uh, until you have something that looks healthy to suture to, otherwise the axon simply won't regrow. Okay. Uh, try to reapproximate while maintaining the original orientation if possible. Uh, very important that it cannot be under tension. If it's under tension, it will not recover. Uh, and we usually use something pretty small like an 80 uh, nylon or a 10 nylon to suture it under the microscope. We just suture the epineurium together, a few sutures, uh, trying not to disrupt the actual axons. Um, and then we usually cover it in fibrin glue. Uh, grafting nerves. So the, the most common donor by far is the, um, the sural nerve. Um, there are other ones as well uh, in the arm. Uh, the graft length should be a little bit longer. Again, we want to avoid tension. Um, and we attempt the best size match as possible. Uh, for larger nerves, we often have to use cable grafts, so if you take a sural nerve, you have to cut it in pieces uh, and maybe use three or four pieces just to reapproximate the size of the original uh, nerve. Uh, neurotization or nerve transfer is where a functioning nerve, um, the function of which can be spared or will recover, is cut and sutured into the distal trunk of a nerve uh, whose proximal roots, for example, in this case, have been evolved from the spinal cord, and we can also do it for different types of nerve injuries as well. Uh, so we literally take, uh, for example, if here, if you have the musculocutaneous nerve, um, that's been damaged. Uh, you cut that. This is the branch going to the bicep. You then take a branch of the ulnar nerve and you literally sew it right into it. 
the axons can then grow uh, along this scaffolding of the damaged nerve uh, to then reinnervate the muscle. A common uh, misconception uh, among medical students and some residents is that when you do this, um, that what you're doing is actually connecting the axons from this nerve to the axons to this nerve. Uh, that's not true uh, because the damaged nerve, when you cut it or if it's been damaged, uh, these axons will degenerate over time. They'll undergo valerian degeneration. So the whole point of doing this is really just to use the scaffolding of the damaged nerve, which will allow growth directly into that muscle, but it doesn't actually connect the axons together. Uh, tendon muscle transfers, these are done by either plastic surgery or orthopedic surgery, people who are subspecialized in this. And there's a whole uh, host of different transfers that can be done. Uh, this is an example of a gracilis uh, muscle transfer uh, to uh, reanimate elbow flexion. And here they use a spinal accessory nerve to, uh, to innervate that muscle. Uh, but I won't go into detail in this. I don't personally do these operations. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, last thing we'll talk about is brachial plexus injury. Uh, just a quick review of the brachial plexus itself. Uh, comes off C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. Uh, C5 and 6 form the upper trunk. C7 forms the middle trunk, and C8 and T1 form the lower trunk. Each of the trunks then divides into two divisions, an anterior and a posterior division. Uh, the posterior divisions, all three of them, go together to form the posterior cord. Uh, the other ones, the anterior divisions, go together to form the lateral and the medial cords. The posterior cord will end in the axillary nerve as well as the radial nerve. And the other two cords will end in this M uh, branching pattern uh, with the musculocutaneous nerve uh, here, the median nerve, uh, the, and the ulnar nerve. In terms of the actual locations of these, uh, in a normal anatomy, uh, these are up in the neck. The divisions actually happen directly underneath the clavicle, um, and then the cords and the branches are infraclavicular. I'm just going to skip through this slide here. Uh, so differentiating brachial plexus injury from spinal cord injury, an important thing to do um, so look for general uh, common sense kind of thing. If there's a clavicle fracture, most likely injuries around the area of the plexus, uh, a dislocation or damage to the shoulder, uh, blue, bruising in the area of the plexus, unilateral findings, often spinal cord injury, there's bilateral findings. Uh, there's no leg findings, of course, if it's a brachial plexus injury. Uh, flaccid rim, no reflexes. So again, looking at upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron signs on physical exam, uh, and loss of pulses in the limb as well. Uh, and this is a very common uh, exam question in residency. Uh, so differentiating uh, preganglionic from postganglionic injury in brachial plexus. Um, so as we know here, uh, the sensory nerves uh, come in the dorsal root ganglion for the sensory nerves is, is out here, outside the spinal cord. Um, so is the injury distal to this out here or is it in here, which is basically right up against the spinal cord? Uh, and if it's in here, these are usually abulgent injuries where the nerve root is literally pulled out of the spinal cord. Um, and so that would be a preganglionic injury, something in here. Uh, so what does that show? So basically, uh, clinically, we have weakness and numbness in the nerve distribution. You should have, regardless of the type of injury, uh, Horner syndrome, uh, which is injury to the sympathetic chain. That's uh, quite pathognomonic, actually, for a T1 uh, nerve root avulsion, so damage to the sympathetic, sympathetic chain. Uh, so you get the, the ptosis, the meiosis, and hydrosis of the face. Um, you can have upper motor neuron signs, again, if you damage the spinal cord. Uh, wing scapula, so basically damage to nerves that come off uh, very proximally. Uh, from as soon as the nerve exits the, um, uh, the foramina, the spine. Um, so things like the long thoracic nerve or the dorsal scapular nerve. So very proximal nerves, if they're damaged, that tends to indicate a preganglionic injury. Uh, again, cervical cord injury and terrible pain. So uh, brachial plexus avulsion pain is, is one of the worst pains somebody can experience. Uh, so if people are de describing uh, absolutely horrendous pain in a, in a desensate arm, uh, that's often an avulsion injury. Imaging, we talked a little bit about these, the raised hemidiaphragm indicating a phrenic nerve injury, uh, signal change in the spinal cord, transverse process fractures, uh, and pseudomeningoceles. Electrophysiology, um, if you see denervation of the paraspinal muscles, again, that's a more proximal type injury. Uh, no motor action potentials, that would be the case uh, regardless of the peripheral nerve injury, but the sensory nerve action potentials are important here. So if the damage is over here before the uh, ganglion of those particular nerves, then you're going to see a decrease in the sensory nerve action potential. But if the damage is over here, uh, these nerves are actually still in continuity of their cell body. So the sensory nerve action potential will actually be intact, even though the person has no sensation of the limb. Uh, so that's pretty pathognomonic for a, a preganglionic injury. Uh, general types of brachial plexus injury. So uh, pan plexus injury, where the entire plexus is affected, that would be a flail arm uh, with no sensation and only the traps work because those are innervated by the accessory nerve. Okay. Uh, upper trunk injury, uh, also called an herbs palsy, uh, where you get proximal weakness, so C5 and C6 damage, so we're looking at uh, shoulder as well as biceps. Uh, this is the classic kind of exam picture of uh, what it looks like, somebody with an herbs palsy, they call this a waiter's tip uh, position. Uh, so basically you see the shoulders 
uh, adducted um, because the deltoid is not working. Uh, you see the arm is straight. They can't flex their arm because the bicep is not working, musculocutaneous nerve damage. Uh, the arm is also internally rotated, um, and the wrist can sometimes be flexed. The, the point here is that you cannot extend the wrist. Uh, extensor carpi ulnaris, uh, branch of the radial nerve, actually usually comes off C5, C6. So uh, this is a characteristic posture of an herbs palsy or an upper trunk palsy. Uh, middle trunk injury is a little bit uh, more contested. It's, it's hard to just damage the, uh, the middle of the brachial plexus and not the other uh, aspects. Um, but this is usually C7 injury, which is usually a tricep weakness. Uh, lower trunk injury or Klumpke's palsy. Uh, this would usually occur from somebody being uh, pulled, like being pulled from above. The arm gets pulled out um, and it pulls the lower trunks of the brachial plexus and, and damages them. So another example would be uh, if a baby was being delivered and for some reason was being pulled by the arm to get it out, you can get a Klumpke's palsy. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention, Herb's palsy is usually the opposite, so the, the shoulder gets pulled down uh, and away from the neck, and that can be often with motorcycle injuries. And uh, in obstetrics, that can be um, uh, if the infant is quite large uh, and they're having difficulty delivering uh, the body after the head is delivered, they can get uh, tension on the plexus. And in these lower trunk injuries, these are median and ulnar nerve injuries. Uh, in the worst case scenario, you get something that looks like this, where they have absolutely no intrinsic function of the hand. Uh, this is actually more common uh, in spontaneous entrapment, something like a thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, more so than traumatic injuries. Uh, management of plexus trauma, uh, so non-pharmacologic for pain, uh, physical therapy, massage, IC, psychotherapy, uh, meditation, acupuncture are all good ideas. Uh, pharmacologic treatment are usual anti-inflammatories and analgesics. Uh, a nerve pain type medication, so anti-epileptic drugs, very important, things like gabapentin and others. Uh, surgery, we talked about external neurolysis, uh, resecting neuromas. If somebody has a painful neuroma, that every time they touch that area, if you remove that neuroma, they can actually have quite a bit of relief. Uh, neurotization or nerve transfers, uh, tendon transfers, uh, and pain procedures we won't talk about today, but there are some excellent procedures for uh, this awful avulsion pain that people can have. Uh, spinal cord stimulation is relatively non-invasive. Uh, and DRES lesioning or dorsal root entry zone lesioning uh, is very effective for these patients. Uh, some common uh, nerve transfers in the brachial plexus uh, if people do have avulsion injuries. Uh, so two main things you'd want to do is uh, stabilize the shoulder and we'll talk about elbow uh, after this. Uh, so, so shoulder uh, stabilization, so a spinal accessory nerve transfer uh, to a suprascapular nerve uh, transfer would give you the first kind of 30 degrees of shoulder abduction. Um, another one that uh, I, I like quite a bit actually is the medial tricep branch of the radial nerve to the axillary nerve and that's what you see here. So this is a diagram of the back of the arm. The incision would be just kind of along the back of the arm here. Uh, you dissect down, identify the humerus, identify the various muscles. This is teres major going across and that separates the quadrangular space above which is where the axillary nerve comes out to the triangular space below which is where the radial nerve comes out. Uh, and basically you find uh, the axillary nerve here which is not functioning. Uh, you cut it. You then find one of the branches of the radial nerve, usually the one to the medial tricep has a good size match, and you cut this one distally, and you literally just loop it up and you sew it uh, into the axillary nerve. And, and the reason this transfer works so well is because it's so close to the muscle, so uh, the axons have a very short distance to grow before the person starts seeing uh, some kind of recovery. So these are common uh, transfers for shoulder stabilization. Uh, for elbow flexion, uh, Commonly known one is the Oberlin procedure, uh, and there are different variations on this in terms of adding different transfers as well, but this is the, the most basic one, uh, taking the uh, fascicle, the flexor carpi ulnaris, so the ulnar nerve, and transferring that directly to the biceps branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. Uh, so this is the, inc the incision will be made along the, the medial part of the arm up here. You reflect the bicep laterally, you identify the musculocutaneous nerve, uh, you dissect out the different fascicles and follow them back. You find the ulnar nerve, you dissect out the FCU fascicle of the ulnar nerve using stimulation, you then cut that and suture it back uh, up right directly into the bicep branch of MCN. And again, this works very well because you're, you're right there at the bicep muscle. So it has a, the axons have a very short distance to grow, so people usually recover quite well with this transfer. Uh, the other ones that can be used here uh, are the uh, medial pectoral nerve. Um, so this would be done in inf infraclavicular exposure of the plexus uh, or the intercostals, um, T2 to T5, uh, into the MCN. Uh, so take home points, uh, if you suspect nerve or brachial plexus trauma, uh, please do refer them early. Uh, better to refer early so we can see them early rather than six months down the road. Well, maybe, maybe there could have been certain options that weren't explored. Uh, it's very important to keep joints and muscles mobile throughout the entire process uh, and very important to remind patients that this is a very long process um, and nerves grow very slowly.
spectacular review. Thank you very much. Well, thank we you. have time for questions. Any uh, fascinating issues? Yes. Uh, nice talk, uh, Mr. Perra, from one of the uh, end surgeons. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you about your experience with like uh, C7 contralateral uh, transverse imaging vascular exophthalmic nerves for global Yeah, thanks. I, I personally don't, um, but um, going to, you know, kind of going to the meetings and the people who have done these, um, at least in North America, they're not very commonly done in people who are over the age of two or three or so. Um, I mean, they, they work. The problem is that people have trouble relearning the movement, um, so they tend to be functionally poor outcomes. So um, they do work well in, uh, in, in, in natal, uh, perinatal injuries, so, you know, kind of up to young infants, they tend to work, work well because the, the kids can relearn that. But uh, in adults, I've never done it just because generally it's not done in North America. Uh, there was a recent paper in the New England Journal, I think last year, where they were actually doing it for stroke patients. Um, but I think the paper was quite flawed, to be honest, and they reported uh, results. But I think the results were uh, some improvement in function, but I think it was just as a result of cutting the C7 nerve um, um, and rather than actually transferring the nerve. But uh, so, I mean, in essence, I don't think it's really done in North America other than for infants, uh, as, as far as I know. But yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, so this is something that I know almost nothing about, which makes it a great grand mountain for me. Um, but just kind of an idea. Like, as a person who does none of this, I would have thought that this was not a common thing. But it sounds like from your talk yeah. that it is a common thing. So can you just sure. educate me about how often this occurs? You know, who are the patients that you see? What's the setting? You know, are they early? Are they late? That kind of thing. Sure. It's a great point. It, it's not super prevalent with the brachial plexus injuries, depending on where you work. Uh, in other countries where there's a lot of uh, uh, motorcycles, people ride a lot of motorcycles, these tend to be a lot more common. Um, but in the United States, uh, I think it's okay. And it also depends on the center where you are. Some centers tend to draw these uh, patients. Um, but in terms of what I see, we do see patients uh, who come in uh, through the emergency department with, you know, multi system trauma or whatnot. Uh, who's ha that happen to have nerve injuries or brachial plexus traumas, and usually those people will see them pretty soon. Uh, we get referred or we get consulted by the trauma team pretty early if they suspect an injury. Um, I also see a lot of patients in clinic that are referred from outside institutions, uh, other surgeons who have tried different things for more complex uh, injuries or complex nerve tumors and so forth, uh, and they'd like a second opinion, for example. Um, so there's really, um, I mean, to answer your question, there's uh, there are some people who specialize or subspecialize in these things, and in uh, lots of centers actually don't have them. So. Uh, before I came here a couple of years ago, we didn't have anybody in neurosurgery who really did these uh, cases. So I'm, I'm here now, so I've been starting to do them and trying to build the practice. But um, um, it, it varies. I, I think overall they're not super common. Um, but if you're at a big trauma center like here, we certainly see the traumatic ones. Uh, and if you get a little bit known in the community, then people will start referring to you and you start becoming a center. In that case, you'll see more of them. Uh, but I think in a general person's practice, you won't see them very commonly. Though. Please pull. Five minutes. Please pull. Plastic surgery here. <laughs> like, I want. I have a question. I, like, in terms of the nerve repair, peripheral nerve injury, sure. or the open peripheral nerve injury. So, so what sort of your timing? I see a common way to repair. Timing wise, you repair right away. Yeah. You wait. Are you close yeah. injury? How long you wait? Sure. Yeah. For the open injuries, you usually try to do it within a day or two. If it's something like a pretty obvious stab wound or a cut that can be sewn back together. Um, if it's a closed injury, we'd like to give it time to see what happens. Um, so we usually uh, will get nerve conduction studies about three to six weeks and then 12 weeks. And I'll always see them in clinic around 12 weeks or three months out to see how much they've recovered. Uh, if there's absolutely no recovery whatsoever, uh, including on the nerve conduction studies, then they probably have a grade four injury, uh, in which case we'll plan to explore them around, you know, four or five months out or six months out. I have a question about um, a microtube surrounding the nerves to help with growth. Sure. Uh, clinically useful yet, or are they still experimental? I personally don't use them, but people certainly do. Um, I know over at Kaiser, the peripheral nurse surgeon there uses them. Uh, I've never personally used them. Uh, the literature shows kind of here and there. Uh, some people, they swear by them. Other people think they don't work quite as well as, as regular nerves. But um, I, I think, in essence, they haven't been fully adopted by the community. But I think hopefully something in the future when they, the design gets a bit better. Do you use a microscope, or just loops on, or does it depend on the nerve size? Um, for the dissection, I usually just use loops, but for the actual, if you're sewing the nerve together, I'll, I'll usually use a microscope personally. Yeah. All right, a reminder of neuroanatomy 101, looking at that brachial plexus up in there. I'm trying <laughs> to think of all the mnemonics I used to use to try to remember that. 
great review. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.